Welcome back, everybody, to the Hearthstone Championship Tour for the Americas Preliminary. My name is Frodan, and upcoming we have our final match in the winner's bracket, Chalky versus Talion. Uh, joining me on the desk is Raven from the UK, as well as Kevin, hailing from the grand land of North America. How you doing, Kevin? Pretty good, Dan. It's uh, going to be nice to see who this last upper bracket winner is, and it feels really appropriate somehow going into Chalky's games that we came in mm -hmm. off of a Legion advertisement playing that Fell Reaver sound. Yeah, it was pretty epic. Uh, looking forward to that for anybody who plays World of Warcraft, um, as well as anything upcoming in Hearthstone as well. I'm mean, sure people look at WoW stuff, they look at Hearthstone, they see the similarities, but uh, when they start colliding, that's when it becomes really fun. You see Varia, you see Anduin, etc. Uh, Raven, talk to me about some of your favorite moments thus far uh, in the event. I mean, we've had three people qualify. Uh, you, you get to cast a lot of it as well, so just give me some thoughts so far. Yeah, I think just the overall quality of the tournament, you know, uh, seeing a lot of uh, quite a variance of decks. I, in all honesty, just wasn't expecting too much. And seeing the players who brought these interesting different lineups and take advantage of what they thought the current situation would be in the tournament really get far and progress. And on top of that, seeing just a good mix of the pro players, well-known players versus mm. the more unknown players and just seeing how they actually you know, battle it out in the end and see, see who gets those final spots. Yeah, that's right. The winner of this match, Talion versus Chalky, goes to join three other players into the top eight for the Winter Championship next month in March. Now, we don't know too much about uh, Talion. I'm not even sure if I'm saying his name right. It could be Talion or something along those lines. But we do know a lot about Chalky. We know his love for aggro. In fact, uh, Talion is actually banning the Druid, which is not a normal Druid, it's the aggro Druid, from Chalky. Meanwhile, Chalky bans the Warlock from Talion. That's, a, that's interesting. We haven't seen Warlock ban in a long time. Yeah, I think it might just be um, to remove the power. We've seen a few different Warlock decks we weren't really expecting in terms of we thought a lot of it would be Zoo or then just traditional Reno, but we've seen some Demon Locks. And uh, I think it's just to remove that factor out of it and just be like, I don't really want to play against these because we've seen Warlock is quite powerful. You know, a lot of players are bringing it, so... Yeah, I mean, in this lineup, thinking about what we've seen from Chalky, there's definitely the risk that... If you're the aggro player, you don't want to run into a really, really wall-heavy zoo deck. You end up with a flooded board that you can't contest, and zoo can have some really explosive openings. Yeah, I think there's also some information out there that uh, you know definitely helps to line as well, because Chalky's been on stream twice now, and I don't think we've seen to line yet at all. So that's something that will definitely weigh into the equation, whether or not this information ends up being the reason of their success. Going to game number one, we have Freeze Mage versus an uh, aggressive Shaman. Now this Shaman deck should be pretty good at putting on the pressure, but at the same time, we've seen Freeze Mage uh, navigate through some pretty tight circumstances today. And if you get this far playing Freeze Mage, you're not uh, an average player at all. You're definitely a, a very good player at, at Freeze. Yeah, and in this position as the aggro Shaman player, this is not the kind of opening hand I don't think that Chalky wants. Totem Golem is not going to put on enough pressure in the early game to justify getting through the potential defenses that the Freeze Mage player can put up. Chalky needs burn, he needs the ability to close the game out efficiently. Yeah, I think on the, the other side of that though, the getting the minions early is what you want as the Shaman. Like, you use your burn late game to finish up a lot of the time, so at least having access to, you know, he might not keep the whole hand here, but having access to those cards is really good, just so you can get them out pretty quick. He doesn't have the coin to sort of counteract overload to a certain extent, so, uh, you know, it will be slightly slow with no one drops initially, so we might see mm -hmm. the mulligan there for the horse rider, just, you know, throw that that one away, maybe try and get into a one drop there. Yeah, I would I wouldn't mind just throwing away the the horse rider and keeping Totem Golem. If you think about it, Totem Golem curves out well into Totem Golem. You just play Totem <laughs> Golem turn two and you play it into turn three. Doomhammer's not even that bad of a draw either. The, you want to play on turn five because the Freeze Mage can't repeatedly freeze the hero. So, I mean, okay, sorry, let me back that up. You can, but it's not ideal. You don't want to play yeah. two turns in a row. So you're going to be able to get that damage out churning very quickly. These reasons are why the Aggressive Shaman is very strong against the Freeze Mage because it can curve out like this. How do you deal with a 3-4 efficiently early on? You can't really do it. Yeah, I mean, and there's nothing right now we know in Talion's hand that's going to allow him to respond to this effectively. He's going to be put in a position where he has to make some choices about how he's going to react as this board from Chalky develops, because right now he doesn't have the tools to answer any of the threats that Chalky is going to put down. Yeah, he's gonna. He's actually gonna fall into the trap of actually just having to draw now. You know, go straight into arcane intellect, not deal with this totem golem. As, as you said, Dan, like removing a four health minion this early is actually really difficult. Um, and he just has to draw into some answers. Forgotten torch and doomsday oh. is gonna help him quite a lot. Interesting. There's also the flame tongue totem. This is a card that when 
Agro Shaman first came onto the scene, people really put it into a lot of their decks almost as an auto clue. But they started gravitating away from the board and more towards, you know, a lot of burn and face and even cards like Flame Juggler, for example. What do you like this flame? Uh, do you like this uh, Flame Tongue Totem here, Raven? Uh, yeah, I think it's good. Again, like you said, for a bit of a surprise factor as well. It's not like super standard to see it, and especially in a position like this, it's all about just pushing that early damage with the minions. And then you know, as the game goes on, your minions are out of your deck, so the odds on the Shaman being able to draw into so much extra burst to finish the game is going to be really key. Yeah, we saw this from Chalky yesterday, and there's actually nothing that pushes as much damage for two mana in the Shaman deck based on board as the Flame Tongue Totem. Best case scenario, he could roll really high on a Crackle, but look at the amount of pressure that this is going to allow him to put on, on only technically for him turn four, but on three mana this turn. He's got his opponent down to basically half health already. Yeah, and one of the funny things here is like, yeah, he can pink that Totem Golem, but then the Lepanome just gets buffed and hits even harder. Yes. So again, that one drop was actually pretty sick, just to be able to just drop it in there, just squeeze it in the limited amount of mana he had, and, and look at all this damage on the board. It's actually a little bit ridiculous. Certainly, and the thing that you have to also consider Consider is that Shocky won't need the board very soon. As soon as he gets one more round of hits, and Talion inevitably drops things like Frost Nova Doomsayer, or maybe even Ice Bear, depending on his situation, he's got oh, so wow. much direct damage without needing a minion on a board that he can just forego it. He can just go all of it, well, equip Doom Hammer, and just start getting to work. Yeah, well, this game is actually really close to being over. There is an uh, Ice Barrier and obviously the Nova, but if Chaki actually chooses to just ignore this Mad Scientist, go face, equip the Doom Hammer, start pushing for that damage, and then he has two Lava Bursts in hand, so just represents so much damage, and the good thing is, once he hits now, he can actually choose after the hits with the Doom Hammer to just Lava Burst if there's a secret goes down and he thinks it could be Ice Barrier. And behind this, Talion still doesn't have any way to recover. We haven't seen anything come out for him. He might have to play this Ice Barrier next turn to stay alive. He doesn't have a heal bot. He doesn't have... I mean, he can Frost Nova Doomsayer next turn, but in some ways with double Lava Burst in hand, it's already too late for that. Yeah, well, we're definitely going to see the uh, the Ice Barrier get played, I think, and then the Mad Scientist running in trade to guarantee the Ice Block. Because otherwise, as you said, with this much board, like you can't at this point rely on a Frost Nova at all. But what if Chalky triggers the Mad Scientist yeah, right now and this pulls the Ice Barrier instead of the Ice Block? It's actually going to be pretty that key. That would actually be pretty good for him if that was a scenario, because then he could Frost Nova Doomsayer reliably while having that life gain. Because the Ice Barrier does really matter when you have the Doom Hammer as a looming threat. So in that case, Talon was just happy either way for a Scientist to die. Um, and, you know, ironically enough, he draws a, a, a nice block, number two. <laughs> the, the one that he, uh, you know, he, he just barely drew it out of his deck in time, and now he has another one. So he can survive two more turns at least, but still not looking good. Also, you have to account for the fact that Lepronome's direct damage, so the Lava Burst will be able to get through the Ice Barrier no matter what next turn, assuming it dies. Yeah, and the funny thing is with the Lepidome, it, you know, when you've got it on the board against Freeze Mage on this low health, is they can't right. kill it on their own turn if yeah. they're on two or one health, because it will kill them, and, you know, secrets do not proc on your own turn. Exactly. So just that weird thing to try and deal with. We see it proccing then, just to make sure that any sort of Lepidome shenanigans yeah. don't actually happen. It's like, why didn't you just play the Doomsayer? It's like, well, if you Lava Burst the face, he actually would have died. So yeah. <laughs> it's a very heads-up play by uh, Talion, but right now it's still looking dicey at best. It just popped the Ice Block. Yeah. And, and you know yeah. that the reason he played around that is because he's been there like no doubt we all have where you've messed that up and then you're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right. Could, could, you know, get out that game really quickly and pretend it didn't happen and yeah, never precisely. do that again. <laughs> it's usually the Doomsayers that sabotage, right? Boombots, yeah. Leper Gnomes, etc. Those kinds of direct damage that you're not anticipating, not allowing your Ice Block to get triggered. Yeah, and at this point, I mean, Talion has a couple of options available here, but ultimately he really needs to play these secrets out, and that only buys him one turn where he still has no immediate follow-up opportunities available. Jockey was just able to curve out incredibly efficiently, get really good healthy bodies on the board that were hard to remove, stuck, and he's got the weapon in hand, so like Froden was saying earlier, even if the board did get wiped or stalled, there's still enough damage available to just end the game. And also, we've not seen Ancestral Knowledge either. And, the, you know, like that, we're getting to the mana now where you can play Ancestral Knowledge and then still cast those burn spells and even potentially Lava Shock to unlock those crystals. But, you know, we see the, I think the Flame Tongue Totem's actually been the MVP of this matchup. Which is incredible considering it's a totally unique tech that we've really only seen from Chalky in this tournament. Yeah, yeah, I don't think people are running Flame Tongue Tone very commonly. They rather run a knife juggler in the deck or a flame juggler like we like we see there. 
Um, but either way, it still looks very good. Chalky is going to attack because he knows if, even if it is Ice Barrier, he has a chance to get through. Normally, if you anticipate Ice Barrier, then you can just try to Lava Burst first. Yep. But now Chalky wants to reduce the amount of health as much as possible while keeping his options open. So I really like what he's doing, choosing to do right now. Oh, a little awkward. Oh, actually, no, that this was is that's super yeah, intentional. Yeah, yeah. yeah dropping the one health, and now he's got the ability still to clear the Doomsayer off the board. That was pretty cute. I like that. I don't know if the one damage truly matters. I know he has the Flame Juggler, but with two forms of direct damage in the hand. Okay. And the odds on you drawing something else is this deck as well. But I think looking, sort of rewinding all the way back to the start of this game, having Talion start with Alex Straza and Antonidas in hand versus probably the most aggressive deck in the game at the yes. moment. Definitely a little bit of a hindrance, you know. It's not like Talion, like, misplayed or anything there and, like, you know, completely messed up. It was just Chucky got a really strong start. And Talion just had all his late game, which if this was, like, a control matchup, he probably would have been, you know, a little bit happier with. Yeah, definitely. You want to have those cards early on so that you can have the Emperor Thorsten reduce all those values uh, and so forth. He even had draw cards. It wasn't like he had a bad hand by normal standards. It's just against that deck, you struggle against it a lot if they get an early curve of minions like you're bringing up Raven. So Totem Golems... So it ends up being pretty good if you play it on turn two. That was actually one of the biggest criticisms against that card. Totem Golem is one of those things where if you play it on the mana curve that it's supposed to, a turn two and maybe even turn three, it's very good. But in the late stages of the game, it's never nearly as impactful as it should be um, compared to some other minions. So a lot of people were hyped for that card, but they fell off because of that fact. Yeah, I think the big difference with it is is the health total, right? Like, because there's a very, very big difference between having three and four health yeah. on that early in the game. Because you look at things like Fiery War Axe, Frostbolt, all requires like an additional form of damage just to finish it off. Yeah, there's just so little that can take it off the board efficiently in the early game. And we watched exactly what that meant when it came time for Chalky to continue to push damage. I mean, mm -hmm. had he not gotten the Flame Tongue Totem, there was every possibility that there might have been a couple of more turns and there may have been a chance for Freeze to get back in the game in some capacity, but, I mean, he had just the worst possible curve. Like you said, when you start with Antonidas and Alexstrasza in hand, where do you go from there? Yeah, it's, it's tough because the Flame Tongue Totem acts like a four damage charger that has three health, which is really hard to remove. Uh, as long as you have two minions, you get the four attack in. And from that point on, um, Freeze Mage had to make a choice of either spending its freeze immediately and not having any impact on the board the following turn, or taking the damage, being a little bit risky and drawing, and then try to go from that point on. It's just basically lose-lose from that situation. Evaluating the lineups from this point on, uh, Chalky, now that the Shaman's out of the way, is actually feeling pretty good about it because he still has Warlock and Paladin. Um, but now that he knows it's Freeze Mage as well, he has some pretty good information on how to how to really sequence his decks here. So things are already looking pretty good for Chucky, although not out of the woods quite yet. Yeah, and I think from speaking to Chucky in the interviews, he has like a, a bit of a more interesting approach to the way he's brought his lineup. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, you know, these are just, these are the best ladder decks overall, so I'm just going to play them, or, you know, I'm going to snipe this specific lineup. He's actually said, these are decks I've gone to top 25 legend with, so they are just factually good for him, and he's got experience with them. So it's not like saying, oh, everyone's saying, Patron Warrior is good, so I'm just going to take it. I'll practice a bit for the tournament and hope it's good enough. He's personally took these decks very far. Right. He did speak at some length yesterday on stream to exactly how much time he's spent testing these decks personally and really putting a lot of time into seeing exactly what they're capable of. And we know a little bit about Talion's lineup as well now. We know he brought Freeze Mage. We can pretty safely infer that the Shaman is probably Aggro Shaman, which means there's going to be some interesting back and forth here now between the absolute opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of Aggro Shaman being one of the fastest decks and Freeze Mage being one of the best control decks that's available. Yeah, when I look at uh, his lineup, uh, Talions, that is, it, the first thing that sticks out to my mind is he really wants to kill a Paladin. Um, we, we, the Paladin it has two ways it can lose. One to Freeze Mage or Patron Warrior, which is really a dominant board presence. Overwhelming, in fact. It doesn't matter how much you build it. They'll just clear it and build their own um, with their win conditions. The second is to completely kill them before they can get that Mysterious Challenge to turn anyways. Yeah. So if that's what he's targeting, maybe it'll work out, and maybe that's why Chalky's avoiding the Paladin for now and playing the Warlock. Yeah, and we saw some interesting Warlock games yesterday from Chaki. Uh, when we saw the Enhanced Mechano 
on two Sea Giants seems like a reasonable sum of damage, I think. Um, and the Sea Giants are something that's actually, if you can get them out like in a reasonable mana cost, are really going to help him in this matchup because it can just push for so much damage. And other than like Frost Nova Doomsayer that's unanswered, can really difficult to deal with a minion with that much help. Right, even if he can get them out somewhere in the like five, six mana yeah. range, that represents such a significant threat. And it is tough to answer because ultimately, unless Freeze Mage still has Frost Nova Doomsayer available and there's no response to that from the Warlock player, it's actually very tough to get rid of a body that big as a Freeze Mage player. You're built to stall the board, to freeze, to deal two damage with Blizzard, not to have to take an eight health body off the board. Yeah, I think um, a lot of it as well is this also still the threat and why Zoo is very strong at the moment, I believe, where there's a lot of sort of extra damage potential. Again, we saw in some of the Zoo matchups yesterday where you can you run double PO, you run things like Abusive Sergeants, and then you can get like another PO or Soul Fire from Dark Peddler to burst even more. And I think that's the you know the approach you've kind of got to take, especially in this matchup, is you do have to, you know, make intelligent decisions on how you build your board and how much you commit to it. But I think there's definitely, you know, a point of actually just going very aggressive and hoping in. Like we saw in the last game, the Freeze Mage just doesn't quite have the answers it needs. Yeah, and in this position, it feels bad in a way to watch Talion now have the kind of hand he really wishes he'd had last game, where he has some early threats that he can put on the board and actually create some pressure of his own, force some trades out, which in this matchup will also be very helpful. He doesn't want to let a Zoo player just run away with the board in the early game. Hmm. Well, he's not going to do that at all. He only has one option this turn, and it's the Life Tap. And most likely than not, he's going to go for it because early on, you just need to be able to do something with your mana. You don't want to pass for no reason. Unfortunate that he draws a card that he would have loved to play. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it? With the life tap. I think, um, like uh, you mentioned about tapping, I think like the Zulok kind of doesn't mind tapping till around 20 health. And then every single tap's got to be like really the correct decision and like really be needed. Um, but an interesting thing here is the, the Im Gang boss is potentially going to come out here. There is the peddler now as well to potentially use the one drop that comes off. But Talion had a really good, like, very early start and the Frostbolt pickups helped. But now he just has, like, Thaunos, Ice Lance and Flame Strike. So it's a little bit janky, like, no real card draw than the Thaunos. And then no, none of those, like, mid-rangey control cards like the Frost Novas or the Doomsays to try and really slow the game down. Right, but against the Zoo player, I mean, in this in this particular set of interactions, we know that, like, one, Chalky can afford to life tap fairly aggressively in the early game because the Freeze Mage player is relying on Alexstrasza to set his health at a low point and create the burst potential. And on the opposite side of the board, the Freeze Mage player isn't worried about really, really fast damage coming out of a Warlock player. At any given time, on, on four mana, the Warlock isn't going to turn around and suddenly have massive burst potential. So both of these players are kind of doing a little bit of a dance. There's some chess maneuvering that's going to happen here to determine who's going to be in an advantageous position. And Chalky also doesn't want to overcommit to this board. Yeah, there's even a, uh, I mean, there's a pretty okay turn here where you just drop Peddler and Creeper, see what you get, and then uh, just, it's a real tough one, I guess. You trade away into the loot hoarder, potentially, and just leave the 1-1 one -one up. I wouldn't want to give my opponent a card that he can preemptively trade into. You know, you want to give them, you want to force them to either give up the body or to and, and to get the card or just to deal with it and then try to pick it up afterwards. So I, I don't like giving my opponent the card. Uh, the discover is not obvious to us, but some things that stick to mind is just burn. So yep, soul, fire. soul fire being <laughs> an excellent choice. I wouldn't mind killing off the novice engineer, but kills off the loot horde instead. Okay, it's fine. The thing that you have to be mindful of coming into the following turn is this is the last chance you can build before Doomsayer becomes a continual threat. Uh, so having cards like Soulfire with the implosion is pretty huge. Um, something to the point where he might even have to consider if this board gets big enough to play Sea Giant as well. You don't want to get it too big because then if yeah. it's spanned too far, you can't play a minion. And this is actually very interesting. Talion is actually running a Reno Freeze Mage. So he's going to have the ability, even if he gets pressured really aggressively at some point here by the threat of the big bodies like the Sea Giants, to actually recover himself very effectively. And if he's able to clear the board and also do that, there's not a lot of ways for Zoo to actually kind of work its way back into the game and get aggressive again. Yeah, the difference of Reno in this mage list is that it's much more difficult to get that Reno effect off because you run in a lot of two ofs. Um, but you know, we saw like uh, you know uh, back end of last year where Super JJ took um, you know this style of freeze mage and, and did really well with it. So it's all just about being able to. Well, count those cards, really, and, and remember what you've, you've got left and being able to get that Reno effect off. Because the second, I think we've all done it again, where you drop Reno and go, 
Oh, oh yeah, I've still got cards left. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. No, and, and for sure, in Freeze Mage in particular, you do have some advantages in that respect. You're going to use Mad Scientists to thin your deck and get some of your secrets out of the way. There's a lot of card draw, a lot of cycle. He's not going to play it early, but having that option available to him at all, especially in a matchup like this one, I actually think improves his overall chance of getting a really clean win here. Yeah, but when you look at it across the board, it feels like the Reno Freeze Mage is just a little too inconsistent for something like this. However, uh, once again, maybe he feels like it's really good against a lot of the aggro decks that might be coming out, so it could be working for him. But with eight cards commonly in Arena Freeze Mage, and we're looking at Frost Bolts, Ice Lances, Arcane Intellect, Scientists, and the Secrets, um, and, and also the Freezes, Frost Novas, you, you, there's so many duplicates that you might not have Reno Jackson at value, like you said, and it's not even a matter of forgetting it. Sometimes you you just can't have Reno, yeah. and it's a dead card in your in your hand right now. Yeah, I really like this play from Chaki as well. He, he had a few options, but in terms of committing to the board, the Argus is nice because it makes the, your minions a bit sticky, and they're you know not as open to a Blizzard, for example. Um, but he doesn't commit too much either. You know, Argus itself is just a two-three, and it, you know you get immediate damage. So this is pretty nice, and it sets up for the potential of a Sea Giant next turn. And he has really held on to both Sea Giants. He's had the ability to play them previously, but he's chosen very specifically, I think, to keep them in his hand and, and delay that opportunity. He doesn't really need them on the board just yet, and those are really easy to develop threats on the back of something like the Implosion he still has in hand, although that may actually come out this turn to help him clear this Emperor Thoris. Yeah, I'm just thinking, is there a way you can Implosion get two Sea Giants down? No, because I think the maximum board size would be five on his side and and one on the other opponent, meaning the Sea Giant would be cheapest at four. Right, and he'd have to play he has to play cards some, to get to that point. Yeah, he too. has to play cards to get to that point. Unless he kills the Haunted Creeper. Yeah, because you, you don't care about what the implosion was. Oh, wait, actually there is. Uh, yeah, I, th I think you can fail, because if you attack in as well with, say, like the gang boss and not summon the token, because the board's full. I think if you play the Haunted Creeper, and then you have, four, you have five minions on board, then you, the sea giant six. becomes four, and the next one becomes three, and then you trade in the imp gang boss. Yeah, but you can also develop Doctor Boom. Doctor Boom yeah. on seven is a pretty good play too. <laughs> yeah, it's just about possibilities. I think his thought is that Boom will always cost seven. Yeah, and these are the strongest time that Boom bots will always go because it's on curve. Versus when you have cards like Implosion, Sea Giant becomes more flexible. You're not like limited by your board size at all. It's always going to be expanding. Yeah, exactly. And um, this is looking pretty rough. Italian. There's um I'm you know, I'm not quite sure. What I don't think do? he's drawn all his duplicates yet, do? so I'm not quite sure Reno's gonna do too much at the moment. Um and mm -hmm. the, the flame strike even with, with Boom Down and even the Creeper, like and the Boom Bot's pushing as well. This is really rough actually. I mean his best case scenario, honestly, because he hasn't seen any of his AoE freeze effects, might be to flame strike and then freeze or kill Dr. Boom, just so mm -hmm. that he's not at immediate threat of being pushed over next turn. That's a that's a interesting suggestion. You can get away with it if you want to fro uh, flame strike and then just frost bolt. However, there are still some minions remaining with the Haunted Creeper spiders, and that's relevant because of the, the power overwhelming and the soul fire damage. Yeah, the boom fact, bot's only hitting for three. <laughs> that, that that's enough damage to trigger the ice block. And it's still too early for him to do a defensive Alexstrasza, so he's going to be put in a position where he does he. Well, he's not at a place where he, he can Reno he needs yet to at all. Top deck something. <laughs> yeah, he really needs like a like a Frost Nova to set up one of these Doomsayers or something. And, and the problem at this point as well is even if there was just a second Ice Block, you know, to just hold off for one more turn, then the follow-up won't be good enough because like, you Alex Trazi yourself to then stay alive a bit longer. But by that point, we can see that Chakit will probably have at least at least got one Sea Giant down, I guess, maybe even two. I wonder if he's worried here about just, again, overcommitting to the board. He doesn't maybe want to push over this turn because he does have some flexibility in hand, the ability to set up a really good burn turn. He can probably get away with triggering the ice block one turn later, or he can choose to I, push yeah, through I think, right here. I think whenever you can trigger the block, you actually just do no matter what. And um, what you do after that, obviously, you can change based on what you think, you know, your opponent's going to react with. But if you can trigger an ice block, especially, as you mentioned, you know, before an Alexstrasza can come down. So that's one sort of 
you know, safety net removed from the situation already. So you just trigger the block as quick as possible, especially Zoo, and then you just follow up. And like you said, he's not over committing to anything. Mm -hmm. He still has some good minions left, and the gang boss actually helps them generate tokens for the Sea Giants going forward. And kept both Sea Giants, which is also really impressive as well. So does Talion have a way out with what he has in hand here? He doesn't have Reno because... We I haven't seen, seen Blizzard Frost or Frost Novas. Well, Blizzard is probably a one of in the deck, is my guess. I mean, it could vary from person to person. Um, Ice Barrier is reasonable because there's only a six power on board. And you did see Power Overwhelming and Soulfire. Yeah, and a Soulfire, yeah. Right, and we also know the Soulfire was a peddler generated card, it's not like he's liable to have another one buried and, in the deck. And the thing as well, I'm pretty mm -hmm. confident that uh, Talion will know I what would. list Chak is running, so he knows he's probably not expecting Doom Guards right. as well. So, you know, it's not like that's one more yeah. thing you can remove from the potential uh, lethal. I like double Doomsayer here, just because you really want to make sure that the board is cleared. Yep. Yeah, and it looks like so does Talion, so that's, uh, wow. that's a good way for... Oh, and the Ice Lance. Just to be extra safe that he doesn't die. I, I in think, case there is Doom Guard. I think this is a good play, actually, because because oh, he has wow. Alex Straza and because he has Reno, he just needs to just not die. And if he can Reno and reset everything, then Alex Straza is opponent and just kill them. Because he also has Pyro and the Torch. So he has the cards he needs to finish up a game if he can just sort of reset himself in terms of health. I think he also could just Alex himself. Oh my god, is that it? Two, four, seven. seven. 11. That's enough. He's going to yeah, see. It's 11. Yeah, yeah. It's that's 11. enough. There's the fist pump wow. from Chucky. Oh, he my knows. goodness. That's a huge win. <laughs> Zoo is not supposed to win against Freeze Mage. But when it's Reno Freeze Mage, sometimes you stay poor. Yeah, and, and this is probably becoming a real problem for Talion because that's two Freeze Mage games that he's actually really struggled to, to deal with any form of aggression. It just yeah. Whether it's just the draws in general or just, you know, the exceptional play from Chucky, of course. like. It's, it's really rough. Like, I, that's when you hit the point where you're like, should I have not brought Freeze Mage? Like, th this deck's just going to fail me completely. Do I just yeah. auto change away from Freeze Mage for the next match? And we said, like, that was one of his best possible matchups. Zoo is definitely the, the exact deck he wanted to hit with a Freeze Mage. That and Paladin are really why you would bring it to this tournament environment in the first place. Well, the thing about the Paladin is that even though it should work really well on paper, it's actually much closer to 50 50, in my opinion, than what people give it credit for. Uh, however, it, it, the whole point is that this Freeze Mage could be the reason you got this far, but it also could be the reason that you're not over the last final hump here. And that's ultimately what you have to consider when you're deck building. If people know you're playing a Reno Jackson Freeze Mage, which when when Chalky sees Nav's Engineer and Loot Hoarder, yep. and he sees like Forgotten Torch, I think he has a really good idea this is Reno Freeze Mage. Uh, he starts picking up these clues right. once in a while, and that's going to make it harder for for, it. to get wins as time goes on, especially when you're playing up against one of the most fabled decks in the current meta history <laughs> of Hearthstone. Secret Paladin is still going to be very tough, despite the fact that Talion on paper should still be favored. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty interesting, actually, to see the differences in, in deck choices for the players, because Talion could have swapped. I know he has to win with Freeze Mage anyway to win this series, but a lot of players would decide after losing twice, I'm just gonna, I have to win with all of them, so I'll just take a break from Freeze Mage and just play something else. Uh, whereas Talon's actually just gone, you know, you know what, I've brought Freeze Mage, it's done well. I'm just going to go again and see what can happen. But as you said, Frodo, and I actually agree. I think the, uh, the Secret Paladin doesn't get enough credit in terms of what it can do to Freeze Mage. Because the keys, I think, yeah. the secret interactions, the AoE removals that Freeze Mage is known for to keep the board clear, mm -hmm. never works that well, right? Because, you know, so Redemption with Avenge, and then the second you clear, and then there's still power on the board, is it's just completely inefficient for the Freeze Mage. There's also really bad feelings of unintentional collateral that's like when I say that it's things and outcomes that are not intended by a secret pattern which just happens to be very good so for example you're not putting repentance in because it's good against doomsayer <laughs> it just happens to be that if you get repentance at a really well-timed doomsayer you can still kill it and it just happens to be caught in the splash of what it's trying to affect in the metagame these kind like secret keeper getting buffed by ice barrier and ice ice yep. block these type of things ends up being such a nuisance for the secret, uh, for the Freeze Mage because Secret Paladin just does not die and does not relent in its momentum. Well, and, and for better or for worse here, like, Chalky has a phenomenal start 
for this deck. And Talion, once again, is left with not probably the opening hand he wanted. That mulligan did not work out in his favor. He's once again left holding <laughs> Alex Straza in his opening yeah. hand. Yeah, I think one of the things here is the double Frostbolt's pretty good to deal with things like Knife Juggler, but when you go Minibot into Minibot, it just becomes so, you know, Frostbolt's just so mm. inefficient. It just doesn't work. Whereas if, yeah. if he went like either Secret Keeper turn one uh, or Juggler, then you know, you're pretty happy with double Frostbolt. So you just get the minions off the board, keep it clear. And there was even a chance he did choose to remove the shield there, but a lot of players actually just want to go, okay, turn two Doomsayer, I bet you can't kill it, and then just to slow the game down. I think Talion's going to feel very tempted to play the yeah. the draw card, but I think the Doomsayer is the right call. Yeah, I yeah. think you just have to, don't you? Because otherwise, we've seen in earlier matches, Secret Keeper's a pretty reasonable card when it comes to, <laughs> you know, like, potentially running away with the game. I mean, what did the last Secret Keeper get up to? Was it like a 9-10 or something with Divine yep. Shield? It's yeah, like, and yeah. Taunt. Yeah, it's BGH like, range it's, by the end of the game. It's basically one win fury away from being everything Alakir wishes he was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, and this is okay because... This is a good tempo position, again, for Talion to be in. He now can afford to draw, take some time. The pace at which Chalky can develop threats Ooh. is not quite as bad, but man, those draws. Still awkward for Talion. But you know what? Chalky is not snowballing on the board. He has to reset his position. Either way, he develops three minions onto the board, or sorry, three attack onto the board. But if he chooses Muster, if it's more flimsy to a Cone of Cold or very vulnerable to just the hero powers. It's just, it's really annoying. I think the, the big motivating factor is that he has a cog hammer and he really wants to get the hits out with the Vice Justice. So if it's equal power and it's also a little bit of frustrating, just develop that. Yeah, and Chucky's probably feeling pretty good overall about his hand, although it's looking a bit a bit low in terms of card number. He does have Mysterious Challenger for six, which is obviously, we all know, a fairly impactful card. Uh, and he does have Lothab, which is pretty much the best card against Freeze Mage. Yeah, yeah I mean, some it, would say it's impactful. <laughs> it's pretty impactful. If you're Chucky, <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's if okay. you're Chucky in this position, I think you feel good pretty much no matter what, because even if this game doesn't work out totally in your favor, Secret Paladin is just one of those decks where if you get the optimal opening, you have a phenomenal, phenomenal game plan and can win against just about anything. He's got a pretty strong start here, but if for some reason he's not able to close it out against Talion's Freeze Mage, he's going to be able to be pretty competitive against the rest of Talion's lineup as well. Yeah, but bear in mind, we we have seen reverse all kills against Secret Paladin so far this weekend. Well, yes, that, we have. That has happened, so it's not definitely not a sure thing, uh, but Chucky's probably feeling pretty okay at the moment. He does. I really like saving the Lothep here. Turn six is an Emperor Thorson turn. Again, you want to time Lothep around turns where your opponent wants to play spells and yep. not the minions. So turn six, turn nine, um, those are probably the off limits. Ones. Yeah, in a, in a lot of matchups, it's okay to just drop Lothep on five and say, yeah, you know, like you can't cast spells and I get a five five. Freeze Mage, definitely not one of those decks where you just go, yeah, it's a five yep. drop, five mana, go, you know. It's actually one, you, it's all about timing and mistiming that Lothab can actually just straight up lose you the game. Now, another interesting thing is how do you deal with the Thorsen after you play the Mysterious Challenger? You want to keep some of these Divine Shields because uh, area of effect cards like Flame Strike and Blizzard are very devastating. So the longer you can keep your board out there, the higher chance you have to win. Yeah. So how would you go about this, Raven, when you play the Mysterious Challenger? So I like just throwing all the 1-1s one -ones and the weapon into the uh, into the Thoros and, like you say, to keep the Minibot with the Divine Shield, because then if that gets avenged, um, or even if it gets killed off by an AoE, then it would be uh, that would probably be the redemption target, I think. So, you know, you can gain potential from there, but sure. e either way is not too bad. Like, you know, he, now he's gaining additional minions instead. You know, he gets that okay. one extra token, and Mysterious Challenger is a card that is much more powerful when there's other minions on the board as well. Right, and now Talion is looking at this, and he knows that with the full Christmas tree effect on Chalky's Paladin, that there's absolutely a repentance in play as well here. So he's going to be very conscientious of that as he goes forward, what trying to make sure he doesn't run into Frodan's favorite repentance on Doomsayer problem. I just want to see one day an eye for an eye be the reason you kill a Freeze Mage, because be nice. Freeze Mage would take damage on its own turn by pinging you and then putting one damage to itself. That would be really awesome. Still has not yet. The only other one that's similar to that is the uh, Repentance when someone plays Draxus. Oh, and then, and then they swiftly <laughs> understand how that <laughs> works, how the interaction oh. works, and you're like, yeah, and then you just poke them with Light's Justice so good. to end the game. Yeah. That, that, I, I've actually done that before, so I was pre pretty happy. I think my opponent wasn't too happy, but, but still, yeah. you know, I had a good time, right?
Oh, okay. So the Repentance uh, place is in the exact same spot. I was thinking that it was inconsequential, Chalky's positioning for Kona Cold, but it just happened to be perfect because Kona Cold can't hit everything. Yeah. And because of the way the Avenge landed, the mini bot gets the extra damage. A really big nuisance for Talion. He loses an additional five health that he would not have if that was the case. Yeah, and, and this is looking really bad for Talion, actually, because as we noted earlier, they're not just slamming Lothab on turn five. Chucky's already got a powerful board that isn't going anywhere too soon. Uh, he can now restack the Avenge if he wants to, and he still has Lothab for that real power play. He can't quite prop the block this turn, but I think we might just see like maybe Avenge Creeper uh, just to you know st steady stack up, because again, Lothab's not going to do too much. You normally want to just prop the block uh, and then Lothab yep. and then move on from there. And he and now drawing Tyrion, that's also a pretty reasonable card. Yeah, it looks right now like Talion's probably going to have to play the first of his Frost Novas just to defer the damage from this board, even though right. he doesn't have a great way to clear it, because the Flame Strike alone is actually going to leave multiple bodies behind, and one of them is going to benefit from that second Avenge. You know, one thing to consider, too, is that you might be looking and saying, why not Chalky playing Lotheb to set up for whatever would happen? Like, he keep his board intact, but he knows that with Emperor Thorson now, Frost Nova still can be played for seven or eight mana, and afterwards, it just becomes more complicated. So he's saving it for this moment, actually, after the Alex draws so he doesn't die. Yeah. Which uh, is going to be really good, because now that he plays Lothab, he's going to be able to pop the Ice Block and be able to kill Alex Straza and be able to play Lothab. However, is that enough stall? Because that Frost Nova from the hand is pretty big. Chalky has to find a way of putting his opponent down to range within the weapon hit and make sure that he can survive the next turn. I mean, if he does, if Chucky does play Lothep here, I think there is Let enough pressure think. to make that work because the Frost Nova alone is going to cost him his entire turn. Yeah, he needs another Ice Block. That's it. Uh, if he gets another Ice Block, I think there's a chance for him. There's definitely a chance for him to win because then he can uh, Frost Nova the board, Frost Bolt the face twice, and then Pirate Blast for the win. So if Talion gets another Ice Block, he's in business. But if not, we're looking at an extremely swift 3-0. Against Freeze Mage Against as well. Freeze Mage, can Chalky be the next person to go to the Winter Championship? We're about to find out. How close is Talion to Reno? Is there any possibility that okay. Reno is active? Great question. So he uh, he played, two, he has two Frost Bolts, he has two Frost Novas, Ice oh. Barriers in hand, Ice Block was just popped. Uh, he Did he play Scientist? I don't think so. I thought he played one scientist right at the beginning of the game, yeah. Okay. That, was that last game? I believe that was last game. Because he, he, he pinged the mini bot, right? He's You're gonna right. try! Oh. He's gonna try. No! no. no. Oh. Reno killed him! Oh. <laughs> he did the wrong one! <laughs> Chalky is the fourth person to go to the Winter Championship, punching a repeat performance into the Americas Championship. What a job well done by him. He is so excited to be back because you know, Chucky is a player that has a lot of obstacles come his way. Uh, you know, he's, he's not necessarily the most popular player, but he's been around for a long time. So the only way he can prove himself is through consistency. And I know this win meant a lot to him. So that was a huge victory. Yeah, and I think even like looking at how he's played overall, we've seen a lot of him on stream mm -hmm. and looking at how he's approached this and with his lineups and his actual play, it's difficult not to peg him to actually just potentially take the whole thing in a few weeks' time. I mean, we've been able to follow him all the way through this tournament, which has been great. And I think looking back now, he's played some really phenomenal games. He's showcased a wide variety of decks and flexibility in playing those decks. And now this is putting him on the path to have realistically his first major finish if he can go the distance in the America's Winter Championship. You know, he is one of the players that's been responsible for innovating some of the decks. Maybe maybe you're not a big fan of the decks, but when he, when Face Hunter was considered dead because of Undertaker being down, Chalky is one of the first people to put it on the map with cards like we'll Work and Infiltrator. If you remember the days of Double Doomhammer and Shaman, Chalky is another person that really pushed that forth on the America Championship stage in 2014. This guy has been innovating, he's been faithful, he's been practicing really hard, and we're really grateful that he's been so loyal to us. So we appreciate everybody who's been able to tune in. That wraps up the win bracket we still have four more matches following in the lower bracket to see who can also join them with their last chance on the line but we're done here on the desk for now we're gonna head over to TJ Sanders aka Azumo for a few words with our winner thank you very much Dan and the great cast on the day so far guys yeah that was a, a pretty good matchup it was pretty one-sided uh, in favor of Chalky as well. Uh, he did bring some of the fast decks. Shame we didn't get to see the Aggro Druid, but it did him well uh, in the tournament so far. So uh, I'm actually...
I'm actually joined with Chalky for an interview. Chalky, can you hear me? Hey, what's up, TJ? Hey, man. Uh, first off, congratulations. Uh, second off, you're well known among the Hearthstone community <laughs> for not really winning many tournaments. Is the America's wow. Championship going to be the one where you break the second place curse? You know, I really want it to be, TJ. I'm going to put everything I've got into this. All right, well, I, I certainly hope so. Uh, also, I want to get your thoughts on your deck list. What do you think separated you uh, from the rest of the field? Uh, wh how did the difference between your decks make the difference in winning and making it to the America's Championship? Uh, so the first thing I did was decide on the classes and decks I wanted. And then from there, I did a lot of ladder testing. But instead of just kind of looking at win rates and things, I looked at it on kind of a card-by-card -card basis and determined what cards I really didn't like uh, from the list. So like in Shaman, I wasn't running Ancestral Knowledge, and I was only running one Lava Shock. And the Lava Shock was originally cut. It made it back in because I really wanted to play Dr. Boom on 7, and I, like Lava Shock helped that. Um, but like I had two flame tongue totems, that card has the highest win rate in that deck uh, on a card by card basis. So that card's really insane. Uh, just did well in that previous match as well. It's basically a four three with charge if you can land it for two. So pretty good. Uh, but yeah, I'd, you know, just kind of like went a little deeper into the, the aggro deck building than most people do on the surface and came to some interesting conclusions. And now that you've made it through to the America's Championship, I want to get your thoughts on some of the quotes that you gave me earlier in the week. One of them being that Tuskar Totemic is the best card in the game. Was that I, I included you. in your Shaman deck? No, uh, it, it was at one point. Like, um, I was noticing on three I, I wanted to do things a lot more. And after about 30 consecutive games of not getting a Totem Golem off of it, which in theory is like a 12.5% chance to just win on spot, I, uh, I cut him, so that was, that was kind of one of the more jokey quotes. The other ones were legitimate, but yeah, Tuskar Totemic did not make the cut. I believe the other ones being two Doom Hammers is stupid, and if you're not bringing Dr. Boom in all four of your decks, you're doing it wrong. But yeah, uh, big congratulations. I just want to give you uh, an opportunity to thank maybe the people that helped you prepare for this event and helped you along the way to make it to the America's Championship. Yeah, I really just want to, I mean, I've got so many people to thank uh, on the road here. Obviously, I just want to start with my team, Team Dignitas, my teammates, the organization. They've all, you know, helped me through this process. Um, just last night, I mean, without me even saying anything, my teammates had, like, researched the list of the guys I could potentially face, not even, like, my next opponent. They were like, okay, if you lose, you might face one of these two guys. I've got, like, partial lists, and so... Those guys, even though they're not even playing, they're helping me so much. Uh, so big shout out to them. Big shout out to you know the Salt Boys again, my my big friend group on Skype. Uh, all the guys that you know I've loved spending these two years in Hearthstone with. Uh, they really keep me going. And thank you to just everybody that's been out there supporting me on social media or on Twitch or whatever. Um, just it's really awesome just to see people you know put aside what decks they don't like or whatever and just really cheer for me as a person, you know, regardless of what I bring. And so thanks a lot for the support, guys. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chalky. Once again, big congratulations. Look forward to seeing you in just a few weeks for the America Championship. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right. Well, with that match behind us, that means we have a yet another player who will be moving on to the America's Championship. Uh, next up, we're going to have the win or go home matches as we head down to the lowers bracket, I do believe. So there's going to be a lot of exciting matches still to come. Make sure you're still heading out there on social media. Hit us up on Twitter. Use the hashtag HCT. Let us know what remaining players you're, you're still rooting for in this tournament or your favorite moments. Also, if you're excited to see some of the players that we've already seen qualify for the America's Championship, let us know as well. Some of your, some of your tweets might be featured on the stream throughout the broadcast. You can also hit us up on Facebook dot com slash hearthstone and uh, if you missed some of the action yesterday or after today if you've missed some of the matches earlier you can hit us up at youtube.com slash hearthstone to watch all of those vods but we're gonna have to go to a quick break but don't go anywhere guys more hearthstone championship tour action continues right after this